Uh, really nice to see such a high level of interest here. It makes me feel a little bit nervous, but never mind, we'll, uh, we'll proceed with it. Uh, what I'm going to look at, as Tarani said today, is uh, observational methods and approaches to research. So I'm trying to make an appeal not just to social scientists who might be working with a more realist uh, attitude, but also perhaps those of you who are in humanities who might be working perhaps with a more constructionist uh, view of the world. So uh, I've, I've rather grandly, well, I've used an acronym called OMAR, so Observational Methods and Approaches to Research. Uh, I'm going to look at advantages, processes, and I'm going to give you some kind of practical uh, guidelines as well on generating narratives or performances or data if you're, uh, uh, if, if you're a social scientist. So, I mean, my own experience was that I used observation, I think, very productively uh, in my PhD a couple of years ago, uh, which was on uh, gay men and ageing. And I, had a, I did observational research uh, within Manchester's kind of well-known, if not notorious, uh, gay village. So I've, you know, I've got that kind of experience to draw. And I'm not going to, I'm necessarily going to share any of my own experiences with you today. I may just advert to them from time to time. But anyway, the agenda is that um, I'm going to say, start off by saying a little bit about uh, observer roles that are actually available to anybody who is actually contemplating uh, or in the process of using this uh, uh, particular method or approach. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to outline some of the main approaches uh, that might actually inform uh, your practice here if you're, if you're actually thinking uh, of using it. So, uh, and I'll kind of advert kind of rather subtly from here, here and there to these uh, big concepts of ontology and epistemology. Now, I assume as postgrads that you're all quite familiar uh, with those key concepts uh, by now. But, th but these are very much part of, perhaps in a very subtle way, in a more implicit way, uh, the approaches that I'm going to outline uh, and actually share with you. Uh, now, I'm not actually going to give any answers, really. I'm, I'm going to sketch out the kind of potential and possibilities uh, of, these, of this particular method or set of methods. I really would like you to, to kind of arrive at your own conclusions, which are actually right for the work uh, that you're actually doing or that you might be contemplating. But what I want to do is, in, in taking a kind of critical look as well uh, at the, the range of methods or the range of approaches available to you, I also want to perhaps strike a few notes about preventing, minimising or dealing, any, anything, uh, dealing productively with any of the challenges uh, and problems that this particular method or set of methods can actually throw up. And I'm going to say a little bit about the ethics and politics of research, uh, and hopefully at the end of time, something about analysis strategies that are available to you uh, if you're actually using this method. But there is some group work and uh, opportunity for group work and feedback session for about 20 minutes that I've actually built into this session. Finally, um, if, if time or if, if need be, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a summary of the keynotes of the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, keynotes of the presentation, uh, and maybe there'll be, there'll be time for a few questions if, uh, if anybody actually has any. So I want to begin with by making a, a basic kind of distinction, really, between ethnography, which is Im where, where you're actually immersed in uh, a particular culture or realm or particular field of experience, which, which you might actually be used to. You might be a, a legitimate member of. Or, or alternatively, you might actually be going into a very new kind of world. But anyway, the point of uh, a more ethnographic uh, style of research is that you do try to immerse yourself in the culture and try as much as you can to understand it uh, from the position of what we might call a kind of native or somebody who's actually habituated or used to being uh, in that particular culture. But ethnography actually um, can, can encompass a whole range of techniques uh, from uh, on-the-spot interviews as well as observation. Uh, it can involve photographs, people's personal photographs, uh, images, all sorts of visual data, videos, uh, you know, self videos, uh, self taken photographs, personal documents, diaries, da 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 da. -da. The list is kind of endless, really. And I've also known anthropologists who have been on kind of major uh, research projects who've actually included questionnaires uh, as part of their kind of eth a multi methods uh, ethnographic approach. However, the distinction I want to make is that. Um, um, many of you might actually want to use participant observation. I mean, I, if I'd really wanted to be ethnographic about my research on gay men and ageing, maybe I'd have gone and become a kind of um, a barman or, or, or a busboy, you know, a glass collector within the village and totally immerse myself in that particular life. Of course, I couldn't do that. I had other responsibilities. I had a PhD to write, et cetera, et cetera. So really, my, uh, my engagements there were actually rather calculated. Uh, and some might actually argue that, uh, you know, critics of this particular uh, of participant observation as opposed to ethnography is that this promotes a kind of rather instrumental, quick and dirty, hit and run 
kind of account that freezes things in time and actually fails to capture the, the dynamics, you know, the evolving nature of a particular field of experience or set of events. Um, I'd, I'd ar actually argue against that. I, th you know, I think it's, it's a misplaced uh, criticism. And I think there are all sorts of measures that we can actually take to actually to prevent that from happening. And I, I mean, my own strategy really was to go back about 20 times into different spaces at different times. And I did a bit of time sampling, given that certain things are di di behave certain behaviours are more legitimate than others at certain times of day uh, in that particular uh, cultural space, which can actually work discursively as well. So. Um, the, 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 one of the, the, the key things is that um, whether it's ethnography or participant observation, according to the textbooks, is that this should take part in kind of naturally occurring places, natural people's so-called natural habitats, which is a bit of a borrowing from uh, the idea of, you know, like uh, naturists do, of looking at animals in their kind of natural habitat rather than taking them out and looking at them in a more kind of artificial, artificial way. Um, but, I mean, what we might say is that uh, we might actually, if you're a more, more of a constructionist, you might actually want to, you know, to contest the naturalness uh, of any particular space. And indeed, I think it's probably true to say, as, as Bell and Valentine have done, is that spaces actually are not voids. In fact, human actors have a huge um, you know, uh, role, uh, hugely implicated, in actually creating space around them. Okay? So we could actually look at it in that rather constructivist, and I think rather uh, productive way. Um, it's also in, it's an iterative, like many other uh, qualitative methods, it's iterative in the sense that there's constant ricocheting between the narratives, performances or data that you're actually generating and the theory or theories that you might be reaching for to try and explain what's going on within a particular uh, cultural milieu. So it's kind of recursive as well. There's a recursive thing going on in that, I mean, I, I, in my particular project, I used, I used interviews as well as uh, observations. And what I'd found was that I was able to, kind of, from interview data or interview narratives, I was then able to refine the kind of questions I was actually, actually asking in interviews. And of course, that's a two-way street. It can go uh, the other way as well. So this is one of the kind of advantages of using it. Now, I just want to say a little bit about, there's a, there's a rather robust and long-standing uh, typology of the roles that are actually available to participant observers. And it was uh, developed by somebody called Gold. I can't remember his, his first name, but it's as far back as 1958. Uh, and basically, um, it's a kind of spectrum, really, isn't it? From, you've got over here, uh, the complete observer um, where, for instance, it might, I don't know whether any of you saw the Masters of Sex last night, but there was Masters and Johnsons, those well-known th sex therapists, were actually observing people having sex behind a one-way mirror. So that's the kind of your complete observer, where there's no, um, no appreciable contact or involvement with the people who are actually under study, who are, whose lives are being researched. Then we move across the spectrum a little bit more. Um, to observer as participant. There's a kind of little, you know, there's a, a kind of slightly higher degree of um, involvement and connection with the people that you're actually studying here. Then we move over to the role of participant observer. So we're moving across, uh, you know, going from being lesser to more actually involved, and to, to an extent where people might actually become complete participants. And I remember that uh, many years ago, there was a study of gay men's behavior in saunas, you know, because sexual, like, these really hyper-sexualized spaces. And one guy kind of commented on the how, at times, you know, he actually threw caution to the wind and became a complete participant within that particular milieu. And of course, the argument is that one ceases to become, uh, if you like, objective. One, one ceases to lose a more objective handle on what is actually going on. Uh, in that particular space. I mean, I, you know, I think we can counter criticisms like that by saying that, well, you know, by taking a kind of temporal distance, time out from the field for the, the intense uh, set of phenomena that you're actually observing can give you some kind of critical purchase uh, on what, what is actually going on around you. Now, the, the word on the street is that uh, generally that um, the complete observer is, is um, uh, more connected with if you like, covert, as Masters and Johnson were in the uh, television series last night, and that you're more likely to be overt if you, the more that you move along this particular spectrum to the right to being the complete participants. This doesn't always follow. Whilst it might be a kind of rough rule of thumb, um, you, of course, it is quite possible for you to be almost complete participant, uh, but also to still to be covert about your identity and, and why you're there. Now, for instance, I, I couldn't be completely overt 
uh, with people I met in Canal Street. It's, it's just practically difficult to, to get people's informed to consent for me to observe their behavior. So, you know, I had to be kind of pra pragmatic about it. Of course, it does have ethical implications, which I'll come on to uh, in a little while, actually. But, um, but the, the reality is that um, as you start observing, that you kind of move backwards and forwards along the spectrum. And according to context, according to where you find yourself in these very multi-sided, multi-dimensional cultural spaces that you, you know, again, you, you, your role might actually vary to, to suit the circumstances um, at hand, basically. So that's a, just a, a brief review of the kind of levels of involvement and the particular roles that uh, are available to you as observers or budding reserve, uh, observers. Now, I just want to say a little bit about um, the particular approaches. Now, these are by no means mutually exclusive. Uh, to an extent, some of them are kind of a little bit incompatible, but as, as I go through them, you will notice that there's quite a fair degree of overlap uh, between these particular approaches. Now, uh, this has been outlined, I think, very use usefully but by an ethnographer and a rather kind of celebrated text now, an uh, American guy called John uh, Van Marnen. Now, uh, the first one that he identifies is the kind of realist approach. It's the kind of classical uh, sociological study um, and the uh, realism, I suppose, um, relies on that metaphor of mining social reality, the surface social reality, until you reach the more real reality that, that animates what goes on on the surface that actually uh, lies beneath. So uh, the focus is very much on, if you like, the done workers, uh, uh, Van says. So it's about that process of drilling down, looking at uh, what lies beneath or within the matter of fact or the natural or everyday uh, instances of behaviour and interaction, to, to penetrate through to that underlying uh, reality. Now, I also suggest a more authorial way of knowing, where you're kind of quite omniscient, and what you say actually goes, and it's given to the reader as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, this is, the, this is the reality, this is what really is going on. Now, of course, that has actually been contested, um, and I'll say a little bit about that uh, in a moment, but, but these kind of approaches actually have been very useful nonetheless in bringing out some of the subtleties, some of the, the hidden injuries, if you like, of social class, for instance. So there's a, a, a text by Gillian Evans on uh, the educational uh, experiences of children in South East London that is a fantastic and really instructive and very passionate uh, uh, ethnography that is based on this kind of approach, really. Um, as a counterpoint to that, there's a kind of, in, an, in more construct constructionist uh, mode, uh, perhaps, and, and thinking about reflexivity uh, more consciously, there's, uh, Van Manen identifies confessional tales, the confessional type ethnography, which is a very much a, a kind of auto-ethnographic. It's about um, it kind of, it, it, he, as it says here, bridges constructionist postmodern feminist thinking uh, and focusing on, focuses on how the socially situated, accountable, reflexive doer, the researcher, shapes the actual account of the shift, shifting scenario. So really it's about how, our pre, how we've framed the research problematic in the first place and also how our own biographies, our own political sensibilities, our own biases, I think, can productively uh, inform how we begin uh, to look at the lives uh, of others. So it's really about um, taking a, a, a kind of, um, it, it, it's looking at intersubjectivity, your relations with anybody that you're observing, if you're doing it overtly, perhaps, um, uh, as a means of producing credible rather than necessarily valid or accurate knowledge. Now, I think that's a much more interesting project to me. Uh, whether it's what somebody tells me is the truth or not is can be interesting, but I I like I'm more interested. In, I suppose favouring a more constructionist approach. I'm I'm more interested in how people attach meanings, how they make sense of uh, their particular surroundings and their own uh, social positions. So, but anyway, th this particular um, uh, approach has been criticised for if done wrongly. It, it, it's all at all at the level of of the practitioner. It can lapse into a kind of self. Na you know, navel-gazing, kind of self-absorbed uh, kind of tale that says much more about the researcher than it does about the culture that he or she is supposed to be uh, observing. So that's one of the, one of the criticisms. Um, a third one is uh, an impressionist uh, mode of, 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 of uh, participant observation or ethnography. Um, and this is largely linked to symbolic interactionist or phenomenological uh, theorizing or eth ethnomethodologists are quite, can be quite fond of it as well. And it's, it's the impressionist take that concerns the process or the doing, how stories, how narratives are actually accomplished dynamically, intersubjectively, interactionally, with a whole range of artifacts, phenomena, people, events, texts, 
documents, material settings. Now, again, I said that you know, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, so we might actually see how uh, um, this, this particular take it can actually be unfolded in both realist and also confessional, confessional approaches uh, to ethnography. Um, in more recent years, and a really interesting development has actually come from the pen of um, an anthropologist called, who was actually at Manchester at one point, uh, called Sarah Pink. Uh, and she's, she's really moved in the direction. She started off as a visual anthropologist and uh, doing visual research, moving into, more into multi-sensory uh, forms of ethnography. And as, as the slide says, this concerns the kind of uh, the doer and the doing, and, you know, how the doer does things and how things are actually accomplished. But it actually avoids over-focus on the visual and looking productively at how the senses, you know, with smells, so uh, sounds as well, uh, actually work together to, to have some kind of impact, to shape and to influence how people think and, and how they act. So some, there has been some innovative research done uh, in kind of urban uh, smellscapes or soundscapes. And this, this actually approach actually involves the sensing body. So again, you know, you're very much the kind of research instrument, if you like. Uh, the sensing body of the researched and the researcher, and also sensuous effect, affective uh, cultural geographies. Okay. Now, uh, Pink herself has been very quite critical of this particular project and said uh, within Western cultures, and you would expect this perhaps coming from an anthropologist, that we tend to be rather ocular-centric. We tend to overprivilege uh, the visual as a means of understanding, whereas other cultures may actually privilege other senses. So if you're, if you're doing an anthropologist, anthro anthropological study outside of uh, developed societies, in, in you know, perhaps lesser known ones, you might actually want to think about how you accommodate that particular, uh, particular challenge, okay? Um, okay, and uh, feminist approaches. Um, actually visible in the work of Beverly Skeggs, herself used to be here in Manchester a few years ago. Now this, this concerns that recuperative moment, that, um, you know, that move to, 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 uh, to, I guess, to instantiate a more egalitarian relationship between the observer and the observed, between the researcher and the person whose life is actually under study. And it very often focuses on the kind of socially caused uh, problems of women and others and, and other uh, minoritized or disadvantaged groups. Um, but it's actually been productive in questioning, look, opening out uh, discussions of difference between women and avoiding homogenizing of woman as a particular category, as, as though it's a, a kind of singular uh, experience as well. However, what we might say is a kind of criticism of this, it, that is in that many instances, despite this kind of move towards egalitarianism, it very often is that kind of realist note of the realist voice of the ethnographer that actually gets privileged uh, within this particular project. Not always, but it can, uh, it can actually do so, okay? Uh, and last but not least, and this is the kind of approach that I favored myself, it's, it's a more kind of eclectic approach where you can draw on tools available from each of from these several approaches. So, uh, you know, the, it, uh, well, whilst it, it's not a good idea to, to try and uh, recon well, reconcile uh, to very different and irreconcilable epistemologies and ontologies. Nonetheless, we can kind of selectively cherry pick particular tools and insights from these various approaches, put them together in some kind of strategic way, in kind of some kind of strategic bricolage, in order to bring about or to capture or to illuminate or to get to grips with a multidimensional um, uh, notion of uh, social reality, again, as, as enfolding, as, as dynamic and, and multiform. Uh, as well at the same time. Also, remember, I'm not going to say a lot about this because I'm not an expert. This is up to you to think about it if you're doing, doing it. But remember that uh, uh, ethnography has now moved on to into cyberspace. So that you, you might want to look up ethnographers that are actually looking at how uh, this particular method actually plays out when people are surfing the web or trying to get a sense of what's going on cyberly. Okay. Uh, just a few um, uh, practical notes about ethics and politics of research using this particular method. Um, access um, is very much um, an issue. Um, rapport building, uh, it, whether you're insider or outsider, or, or if you're in that kind of liminal position, as I think we are. I mean, I, I would actually question the degree to which, as academics, we can be complete insiders, even in a culture that we're actually all, or, you know, or, or a field of existence that we're actually quite familiar with, because we always have that hat that they don't that other people might not have, which is the kind of academic researcher. So maybe you're on that kind of really productive tightrope, that really productive, liminal, mixed 
kind of position that might give you insights in, in, in various ways. But the point here is that um, uh, rapport building is, is, is uh, really important. And issues of ethics ought to be, they're not a, a luxury, they're not an add-on, they're not a bureaucratic consideration. They need, to be cons they need to be integral to your research design. Uh, they need to suffuse it, and they need to kind of to be there from uh, from start to finish. Now, that brings me on to the next point, which is that remember that you might have secured people's consent, uh, but consent is not actually once and for all. It is actually renegotiable, and you might need additional consent if you're going to publish or speak on the basis of something, or you're going to do something with that data or set of narratives that you hadn't told uh, your cohort, your people actually about. So don't always... Take, take their consent for granted. It might need to be asked for at several key junctures during the, uh, the you know, during your research. Um, there are uh, guidelines from not just from the British Sociological Association, but also from uh, professional associations like the Social Research Association. Um, uh, the BSA actually approves covert um, uh, observation or ethnography as long as you can show that it really is the only way of securing that p access to that particular world or or set of practices or uh, experiences if you like so but see your professional academic associations guide and, and do be guided by by them okay uh, another thing about the covert overt distinction is that it's not as neat uh, as we might think, it's very often quite blurred. Now, imagine a, a scenario where I've got somebody's, again, somebody's consent to do something, uh, and maybe I'm observing them in their call center at an office, uh, and then they go out for a fag break, and I go out afterwards, and I, you know, I'm on, on my way home, and they're having this really interesting conversation about work. That I, wow, you know, I'm really switched on to this. I don't hear, hear this within the... Um, um, with, with it, so talking these, about these narratives in work. I, if you've not asked for consent, you technically you are kind of, uh, you're, you're breaching it there. So it's not, again, it's not a necessarily a kind of clear-cut thing. Now also in terms of ethics, the, the issues of harm, privacy, and deception are not actually always clear-cut. Uh, I mean, I, I, you could ask a perfect, what seems to you a perfectly in innocuous and innocent question that might, one or two days later, a week later, a month later, trigger off a whole chain of associations that might lead that person back into a rather distressed state or, or set of memories. So, so there's basically no perfect control that you can have over. Um, you know, I, I think that the point is, is, is that you should take every possible step that you can to minimize uh, the ca causing any physical but also emotional harm to the people whose lives you, you're actually researching. What I would suggest very often, uh, what I deployed in my own research is the kind of situational ethics, which has been adumbrated by H Howard Good, uh, which involves kind of walking that tightrope, that ethical tightrope, but also making uh, judgment calls uh, both within the field and when you, when you retreat from the field in order to reflect on what's actually happened there as well. And that kind of brings me on to uh, the re reflexivity and, if you like, the politics of research about whose story is being generated. Uh, is it yours? Is it theirs? Who, who does it actually belong to? Um, I mean, obviously, you, you've framed the, the research. You, you've kind of asked the questions, if you like. You, you're the one that's noted down the, the, the notes, the data, etc. You've produced the data, the stories, what have you. Um, but um, particularly if you're interviewing, um, the, the, there's this kind of deception around, where, you know, when, if you interview somebody, then you've got their authentic voice. Well, that, that may not be always so. Because one thing you need to remember is that a very good way of looking at it is, is uh, uh, suggested by Brian Fay is that we, we might treat the people that we're engaging with uh, with a kind of hermeneutics of suspicion. Yeah? We might see them as kind of credible witnesses who know something about their lives, but they're not infallible. They're, they're, you know, we all have a kind of myopia. We all have a kind of so-called blind spots in areas of our lives that we're really kind of perhaps not attuned to or necessarily in touch with. But again, w what we're doing is, in appropriating all this material, is that we're actually transforming people's bodily and spoken stories as well. Um, and uh, Jay Bagubrium and John Holstein uh, have a really interesting... Uh, take on this and say, well, actually, what is happening is that in, in these encounters, particularly if we're engaging with people, that both parties actually draw on publicly available discourse in order to give an account or and in order to produce, co-produce uh, the research data. So in a sense, what both are drawing on is not just the here and now and those publicly available discourses, but whole sets of histories and events and hap happenstances that may, might have occurred outside of what you're actually, what you've been observing 
at that particular moment. So, uh, in fact, the, you know, the, perhaps they're nobody's stories, and we, we can actually productively lay claim to that, because, again, we're drawing on publicly available discourses and, and forms of memory as well. Uh, but my own approach, really, as, as part of an ethical putsch, was actually dia dialoguing with and learning from so I, I, you know, I, I heard this and watched their stories in order to, again, to change my own research questions, to ask myself questions. But at the same time, uh, what I did was I, um, I, the Lesbian and Gay Foundation has a, an online uh, dialoguing uh, capacity. So I put my, my own interpretations of the stories I was generating onto that and in, actually invited comment from, from the community, but also from the people that I'd interviewed as part, as, as, as part of the project as well. So that's a kind of way of being accountable, if you like, um, and, getting, you know, uh, and, and getting their interpretations of your interpretations, okay? Now, something very practical, this, this, this is, you don't have to do this, but this is the kind of model I used for generating the narratives and performances. Now, if you look at the, the left-hand column, uh, this is where I noted things about the relationships that I had with the people being observed, uh, the kind of language that I was using to frame and understand uh, their experiences. And actually, that kind of sufficed in lieu of detailed, a detailed research or field diary, because it gave me a kind of running record on, on how I was feeling about the situation, what was actually happening there, how I was describing people. It's, so I could reflect on that when I was actually writing up the methods chapter. Um, the, the main thing well, was the middle, was the interaction, what was actually going on. Um, I mean, I used my own mnemonics, my own shorthand, uh, which then on retreat from the field as soon as possible afterwards, um, I wrote them up in, that, in what hopefully was that richly kind of descriptive kind of way. Now, one, one thing that you really, I really would advise you to do is uh, it's so easy to get trapped into the spectacular, something that you say, wow, that's, I'll, I'll, that's wonderful, what, what, that's really unusual, what, what are happening, that's really eye-catching. But remember that the mundane and muted performances in social spaces are just as interesting. And you, you know, they enable us to see uh, the momentous uh, in the mundane, basically. So don't forget those. Also, pay attention to time sampling, because there may be different rhythms, temporal rhythms, to the particular cultural spaces that you're actually observing in. Uh, like in my example, certain forms of behavior were not just legitimated, but more expected at certain times of day and certain days of the week uh, than others. And what you'll find is that this is a form of early analysis as you start to engage analytically with the narratives and data that you're actually producing. Now, the, the third column was used very, very sparingly, but it was useful when I actually came to write up my PhD. And what you notice is that I've noted, noted down the kind of theories or concepts that might be used to explain what was going on uh, in the interaction. Um, but I, I use this really sparingly because I, what I wanted to avoid was a kind of premature theoretical closure. You know, I, I wanted to kind of thoroughly uh, interrogate the narratives from various kind of ang angles so I could be sure that I was really illuminating uh, what, what was actually going on. I didn't want to reach any kind of premature theoretical conclusions that I might actually regret and actually close off discussion. How are we doing for time? Um, can I suggest that we have, say, 15 minutes? What I want to do, I, I've probably spoken for enough at the moment. What I'd like to do now is, could I ask you perhaps to work within threes or fours, or how be, however you feel comfortable, on these four questions? Um, thinking, I, I want to anchor it into the concerns of your particular work or your own proposals. I want you to think about how you might apply or how, uh, these particular methods or how you're doing so in your own work and some of the possible advantages. Secondly, what kind of theoretical, philosophical, and methodological criticisms would you expect or have you encountered, and how might you respond to them? Third, uh, what practical and ethical issues and problems might you meet uh, or have you encountered, and how would you, how would you deal with those? And finally, I think probably the most important thing, if you could spend just a few minutes actually sharing uh, your plans that you have maybe for analyzing any narratives or data that you, you generate using this particular, even if you're not going to use it, no plans to use it, but you're just interested, I want you to have a, a kind of think analytically about how you might engage with and use these methods. So could I ask you perhaps just to take about 10 minutes quickly to go through these four questions, then we'll have a quick Q&A, and then I'll go on to, and, and I'll, re, I'll, uh, I'll do the kind of recap and, uh, and wrapping up uh, and share a few thoughts uh, on techniques for analysis with you as well, okay? So can I leave over to you? for the moment, okay? If you do observational research on a topic, you won't do much of anything. Only a small project. 
Just a few ideas about analysing narratives that you might have generated uh, using through this method. One is um, Hammersley and Atkinson's rhetor rhetoric inquiry. So you might look within your data for metaphors, analogies, frames, comparisons, contrasts, looking for the general, the nomothetic, what, what seems to apply within this milieu, and what is ideographic, what might be particular, what, what might be the un less usual or the more newly emergent stories or... Uh, forms of social reality. Um, so, I mean, we might look at the, the kind of devices and discourses that people actually draw on um, when actually giving accounts of themselves, either through the body or through, uh, or through speech as well. Um, you could look at narrative stroke thematic analysis, which doesn't ju just look at the content, what's there, but also what the silence is, what are the erasures, what's missing from this analysis, but also doesn't just pay to content, but also at the same time looks at structure, the, again, the narrative resources or disresources that people draw on uh, to give accounts of their, their social reality. Uh, or, you know, within this particular um, modality, you like, you, you, Ken Plummer is, is a particularly um, profit, you know, um, useful uh, source to look at. That's telling sexual stories, Ken Plummer, 1995. But um, Plummer talks about how stories don't just make... Uh, sense, not just used epistemologically to make sense of what's going on around us, but they ontologize us. We use stories to bring ourselves into existence as well, uh, you know, to make comparisons with, uh, um, uh, between others and, and it, it, in, in ways that crucially shape our identity and sense of selves as well, within, within what Plummer calls uh, flows of power. Um, if you're looking at it in a much more post-structuralist or post-modern way, uh, you might want to look at, consider critical discourse, textual analysis, that, that kind of linguistic approach, that kind of linguistic moment, uh, looking at how the various truths within your data, if you like, within your narratives, are constructed or assembled, again, through text, language, uh, and performance. And that could involve the kind of laying bare of the, that deconstructive exercise of laying bare the constituents of the narratives that... Uh, people actually draw on. Um, sorry to say this, but if you want to be a little bit more depressive, you could look at the look at it, in, look at some of your data or stories or performances in a kind of psychoanalytic way. And the people that you might want to look at here are Wendy Holway and I can't remember is it somebody Jefferson? It's not Thomas, is it? And they talk about a defended self. Uh, so that's really that kind of rather negative psychoanalytic moment where a lot of behaviour is seen as avoidance or uh, as, as a kind of defensive posture. You know, it's, it's all about defending yourself against uh, realities. But, but again, it, it might be useful in certain ways to look at how the unconscious actually works uh, on our thought and behaviour. And as they say, very often we are. I think they have, they, they have, they're onto something here when they say that very often our interaction is, is actually motivated by the desire not to know, uh, to avoid certain uncomfortable things or truths uh, about ourselves. Um, and finally, I, this is one that I really like, actually. And again, if, it's, if you're, you're doing a much more discursive theoretical kind of PhD or project in particular, but I can see how you could bring it to an empirical project, and that is uh, this kind of multi, what I call a multidimensional, multi-level, perspectival, reflexive kind of analysis, as, uh, ha, as outlined in, uh, by Alverson and Skoldberg, who are kind of management, uh, kind of sociologists of the workplace and management theorists, basically. Uh, and they talk about, um, um, I mean, again, it's that project of taking tools for constructionism and realism and kind of putting them together, opening up the contingencies uh, of social reality. Uh, and, and looking at how our interpretations and us as researchers are mutable uh, as the research uh, itself actually progresses. So again, it kind of touches base with that more recursive uh, kind of strategy. So just as, as a, in summary, the take-home messages are things for you to think about. Are Think about the extent of involvement that you might have uh, within your particular field or arena. Uh, be aware that it can actually fluctuate um, quite significantly, and that has an impact on the, the kind of knowledge that you're producing. Uh, choose a style or approach that fits your research, but build in some kind of critical reflexivity. I mean, think of your analysis strategy at the beginning. Don't see it as a kind of endpoint, something, a discrete stage that you come to once you've generated all your data. That's a big mistake.
completely uh, try and I'd advise you to, to avoid that. So these methods can generate detailed accounts that I think illuminate detailed accounts that I inhabited tenanted body, if you like, the mobile body, how the world is constructed within and across various con uh, contexts. I think with, with due care, uh, most of these approaches that I've um, outlined can actually avoid determinisms whilst actually recognising cultural rules and constraints uh, on human agency. Again, um, they recognise... Uh, arenas, if you like, or, or, or fields of existence as multi-sided, multi-vocal, multi-layered, different ambivalent, uh, and is, is a contradictory character to how uh, uh, reality is performed or narrated. Uh, they can, I think they can also enable a kind of productive intersubjectivity that can enable, enable claims to plausible and to an extent to transferable knowledge. Because the data that I, you know, the narratives that I generated within Manchester's gay village, I'm not saying that it actually applies in America, but I, I made a limited and cautious claim to saying, well, actually, the stories of ageing that I've seen here might apply in po similar post-industrial cities in, in the UK that have growing gay villages or gay scenes like Glasgow, Leeds, uh, Bristol, etc. But I made a kind of distinction from London where the gay scene, if you like, where gay culture is a lot more dispersed. And of course, that has an impact on, on people's experience. Uh, finally, eth but last but not least, ethics are integral to the process of this particular method from conception, engagement through to analysis, to write up, and even beyond as well. So really do consider how you write about yourself in relation to others uh, and how, maybe how you dialogue with their knowledges as well. So thank you for listening. I'm going to pause there. And uh, thank, yeah, thank you. Okay.